I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the crisis that everybody now knows that we're walking through. And I would like to welcome you to a very special edition of Coffee with Lynette. Before we get started, though, I have to ask your patience. We had some issues around the audio, but this interview was so important, and at least you can hear our very special guest, Jim Rogers. And so if you please bear with us, I'm telling you, it is worth it. Because Time Magazine has dubbed him the Indiana Jones of Finance. He is a legendary international investor who co-created the Quantum Fund back in the 1970s when we were transitioning into a new financial system. He's also designed the Rogers International Commodity Index in the 90s and is still the chairman of the Rogers Holdings and B Land Interests, Inc., He is a well-respected and much sought-after market commentator and public speaker with a deep commitment to free markets, which, as you know, we at ITM are as well. He has authored many books over the years, starting with Investment Biker about his first round-the-world experience on a BMW motorbike. He began visiting China as a tourist in 1984 and moved his family to Singapore in 2007 just so his daughters could learn Chinese and get to know Asia because, frankly, he knew that China was rising as a global power. I am so glad to have him here today. Jim, thank you for being here today and taking your time. I am delighted to be here, Lynette. Good, uh, I guess good evening where you are. Good morning where I am. Tensions are growing between Washington and Beijing as deglobalization progresses. Today, the U.S. Senate passed a bill that would require companies to certify that they are not under the control of a foreign government or face delisting. But Aren't all companies in China required to set up Communist Party cells to explicitly include the role of the party in management decisions? How do you think this will end relative to the U.S. dollar's global standing as the world's reserve currency? Well, I I don't, some, many do. Yes, yes, I don't know if all are required, but certainly I know many have such committees. But Lynette, that's none of my business. Uh, I make investments based on the economic prospects of the company and the country. And all countries have various and sundry requirements. Uh, I'm an American, so I don't like to see this because that means many, I guess, many companies from around the world are going to have to delist in the U.S. I don't know why that's good for America if they list in London or Hong Kong or some other place. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not a politician. So I'm wondering how you think this will impact the MSCI China and Emerging Market ETFs, which are currently listed on the New York Stock Exchange and, frankly, held by a lot of pension and retirement accounts. Well, it'll have an impact. If you're an American, yes, because the business is going to go somewhere else. Uh, I suspect that whatever shares we're talking about, whether they're traded in London or Hong Kong or wherever, will still trade. They will still have buyers and sellers, but they will not trade in the U.S. As I say, I don't know why that's good for America, but... Of course not. I mean, that doesn't change the economic prospects for the companies or the world. Uh, They'll just trade in a different market. It's easy. I can, you know, I like many people. I can trade anywhere I want to. This is not, you know, this is not not affecting the companies or the markets. It's affecting America. It's not good for America. Well, governments and central bankers seem to think that propping up zombie companies with unlimited debt and money creation can solve the financial destruction caused by the coronavirus. 
China, Japan has done that for many years. How's that worked? It's, it's damaging in the long run. You know, the way the world is supposed to work, Lynette, is if somebody gets in trouble, competent people come, take over the assets of the failed company, reorganize and start over from a sounder base. That's the way the world has worked for hundreds of years. What Japan did, and not just Japan, America too and others, now that they take the assets away from the competent people, give them to the incompetent people and say to the incompetent people, okay, now you compete with the competent people with their money. I mean, it's lunacy. Japan, as you probably know, Japan certainly loved this policy in the early 90s, and the Japanese stock market is still down 50%, Lynette. That's not a typo, 5-0% 30 years later, because propping up failure has never been a good policy for the long run. How do you think this will end relative to the U.S. dollar's global standing as the world's reserve currency? Of course it hasn't. It has. Japan's got serious problems. Japan has peaked. Japan is in decline. The population has been declining for 10 years. The debt skyrockets every day. Every day. Uh, no, it's not helping Japan as a nation or as a society. It's not helping the U.S. I mean, we've got a government in Washington and a central bank. They don't care about you, Lynette. They don't care about me. They certainly don't care about my children or young people. You know, they're spending and printing and spending and printing as fast as they can. There's an election in November. Lynette, don't you know there's an election in November? That's all they're worried about. I mean, everybody asks me, I'm sure you get this question all the time too. Can, can't this go on forever? Do you think it can go on forever? Well, forever is a long time. Of course they cannot. No, no currency has maintained its position as the world's reserve currency more than a century or two. Nothing in history. There's always something moving on and replacing what, what the past was. America is now the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, Lynette. That's not a typo. The largest debtor nation in the history of the world. And last month they added another few trillion trillion with a T. I mean, listen, it's, I, this is not an opinion. Just read the history books and you'll see that every country which has done this has gone into decline, into problems and, and semi-problems. This is not my opinion. I just know what history says. Well, I know that every country in history that has skyrocketed its debt has had problems eventually. Maybe not this month. In fact, this month, things are great. Everybody loves all this free money. But somewhere along the line, of course they do. And the central bank here or in the U.S. is buying bonds, you know, they're buying, probably, who knows, they're buying junk bonds. I'm sure soon they're going to be buying houses in Phoenix. They can buy whatever they want. It's, uh, it's lunacy in Japan. The head of the Bank of Japan goes to morning everywhere, cranks up the printing presses and prints as fast as he can so he can buy bonds, he buys ETF, now he can buy stocks. Now the Bank of Japan is buying stock. I bought Japanese stocks recently. He's got more money than I do. If he wants to buy stock, go to it. I mean, I've just, I've just I've, I've written a few books about Japan in the last year or two talking about the decline of Japan. Well, this just makes it worse. It always has. I presume that the world, that the basic laws of supply and demand and the basic laws of economics have not changed that much. You know, we have a, a new, a fabulous, new, exciting, wonderful idea where we get more money today. It's called MMT. That may, you know, get some adherence because, you know, whenever there are problems, people look for a free lunch. They look for a simple answer. Mr. Marx came along and had a great answer, and a lot of people loved it for a while. I mean, we now know Marxism doesn't work. That didn't mean people didn't try it for a while. Now MMT is, here we are. Maybe they're going to try that for a while. Is that good for my kids? No. U.S. dollars, euros, yen, treasuries, well, all of these things are considered safe haven assets by the markets. 
And I think you hold some of them yourself. But do you really think that these currencies and debt instruments are safe? Well, Lynette, uh, I've been investing a long time. I know you cannot use the word safe when you're talking about the investment community. There is no such thing as safe. If there is, I don't. I haven't found it yet in several decades. Um, people do look for things that they think are less safe or less dangerous. Uh, you mentioned some. I happen to own a lot of U.S. dollars at the moment, not because it's sound. I just told you it's one of the most unsound situations in history. I own them though because people look for something safe in turmoil, and they think the U.S. dollar is safe because of uh, history. So I own a lot of it. As things get worse, the dollar's going to go higher. It's going to get overpriced. might turn into a bubble, and I hope I'm smart enough to sell it. I don't own Swiss franc. I don't own the other things you mentioned, uh, because I know the deep fundamental problems of all of them. I know the dollar has deep fundamental problems. But as I say, people still think the dollar is safe. It's not, but they think it is. You said that after a number of years, you started buying gold again and silver this past summer. Well, what exactly do you expect gold and silver to do for you, and why did you start buying it again? Well, I buy gold before you were born, Lynette. I never sold any gold. Okay, I bought gold a long time. I've never sold any gold. I stopped buying gold in 2010, gold and silver. Last summer, I started buying gold and silver again. I mean, here, Lynette, that's a United States uh, $50 gold piece. $50, I think it is, yes. Here's some silver. Silver, too. Well, it's been down for a long time. Uh, in my experience, when something up has a bubble, and gold, as you know, peaked in 2000, September of 2011 in a bit of a bubble. When bubbles pop, it usually takes eight, ten, who knows how long it takes. It takes a while. It doesn't finish in a year or two. So uh, I, the bubble had been down for eight years. That historically, I mean, this is not magic. This is not even scientific. It's just in my brain. Been making a base for eight years, so I started buying it again, and I could see the problems getting worse and worse. I mean, it's been over 10 years since the United States has had an economic problem. The debt was skyrocketing. I knew we were overdue. But, 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 Lynette, don't listen to me for timing. I'm the world's worst market timer. Lynette, I, I am not here to talk about market timing because I'm no good at it. I will say to you, September of 2011, I remember vividly, I was on a show and I said the gold is going to go down and stay down for a long time. You cannot imagine the derision I got on gold websites around the world. Uh, but, but that was, listen, please, I don't want to talk about market timing because I'm no good at it. And anything I say, if I get it right, is pure luck and I'll probably get it long, wrong. Doesn't that typically lead to hyperinflation? Well, the next time around, I mean, who knows? Uh, I hope that gold does not turn into a bubble because I'll have to sell it. If it turns into, you know, the real, real bubble. And I don't want to, I want my children to own my gold and silver someday. Everybody should own some gold and silver as an insurance policy of nothing else. We all have fire insurance. We hope we never use it. Well, we should all have some gold and silver insurance too and hope we never need it. But, uh, so, but if, if by chance gold turns into a bubble, a serious bubble, uh, then I'll have to sell it, which I don't want to do. And you say, well, what do you do with the money? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens then. Well, the, the most serious bubble right now are government bonds, especially U.S. government bonds, Japanese government bonds. I mean, it, it, it's interest rates are zero and below zero. That has never happened in recorded history. <laughs> that is not that is not normal. That is what is called a bubble. Uh, I am not shorting bonds at the moment, partly because I'm lazy, uh, but that's that's the most serious bubble I see anywhere in the world right now. That's the same bubble. I mean, that's that's those those 
those derivatives are on the bond market. Uh, so it's it's just another way to play that bubble, either long or short. It's all the same bubble. Oh, the last couple of months, they certainly have, you know, had a big effect. All this money has been flooding the world, and you know what's happened to financial markets. Bonds have gone up. Stocks have gone up. I mean, lots of things have gone up. For a while, yes. I mean, they have a lot of money, Lynette. I told you, I bought Japanese shares. Not because, I mean, I'm just, I'm publishing two more books this month about the decline of Japan. Uh, but a country and an economy are different from a market. And so these central banks have huge amounts of money and they have an influence at least for a while. Can they do it? Yes, they can do it. Are they doing it? Yes, they're doing it. Is it good? No ask you this the you know I heard that your very favorite Chinese word so look if I butcher it please correct me is uh, let's see Ouija well, did I pronounce that right I, I know very few Chinese words but one of the things I know is not just Chinese it turns out in Asia those societies have been around much longer than we have. They all have a word. In China, it's Weiji. In Japan, oh. it's Kiki. But the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese all have a word. And by the way, it's the exact same character. In other words, it's spelled the, way, the same way, if you look at it in English terms. It's the exact same written word. And it means disaster and opportunity are the same thing. Now, these Asian societies have been around, you know, thousands of years. So they know that opportunity and disaster are the same thing. So Wei can you... I pronounce it Wei Ji, but don't use my pronunciation. Well, don't use my pronunciation. Yours is going to be far better than mine, I promise. But, you know, they're really that brings up a great point, is that there is always opportunity, even in crisis, if you can get out of your way and not be afraid, but open your eyes to those possibilities. Well, that's certainly something I have learned in my investment career. That when I see in the headlines that there's some kind of disaster, I always feel bad and sorry and everything else, but I now have learned, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe somebody's going to benefit. And if you read that there's a gigantic tornado or, or uh, earthquake in country X, we all feel bad. But I assure you, the people in country a X want you to come there with money to invest because they have problems. Uh, you're not doing something evil and bad. You're not exploiting disaster. Well, you're, you're taking advantage well, of, of the, uh, the disaster and the opportunity, but the people there don't love you. They want you to come there and help them during the disaster. So, yes, opportunity and disaster go hand in hand, and it can be good. And that, that kind of brings me back to gold, because historically, when the central bankers lose control of their schemes and a country goes in, I mean, the currency loses all value, so they go into hyperinflation, those income producing assets, those real assets go on a fire sale, so to speak, don't they? Well, they always have. <laughs> that's, that's a simple statement. Um, you know, you must have heard the expression, it's different this time. <laughs> it's it always different this time, but it, it never is. This time, I assure you, <laughs> the history, if you think it's different this time, find me a time in history when it's been different. Uh, because I have never found a time in history when it's different. Uh, the main lesson of history is that people don't learn the lesson of history. <laughs> you know, people will say it's different. They'll say, what are you talking about history? You're an old toad. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what I mean. The main lesson of history is People do not learn the lessons of history. 
So let's go back to the 70s for a minute because sometimes people will get very excited. They're interviewing me because I was actually there and I remember it. I was a teenager then, but there was a lot of chaos and there was a lot of inflation. And this is really when you started your career was, was back in the 70s. So I know what my experience was. What were you thinking when you were watching the markets implode and inflation explode and and Nixon took us off the gold standard. What were your thoughts then? Well, Lynette, I was just trying to survive like everybody else. I wasn't sitting around writing historical theses. I was just trying to figure out a way by, to buy things that would go up and short things that would go down. Um, I didn't have the luxury or the interest. Uh, I mean, I could see what was happening. Uh, I knew what had happened before. I certainly know more history now than I did then, but basically I was trying to adapt and survive and still am, still am. <laughs> well, that, you know, species over the many thousands of years, those that adapt survive. I mean, so that was really wise. And I certainly, as a 17 year old, 18 year old, I didn't really understand fully what was happening. So I think it's really interesting how they can keep these shifts hidden from us because if, if you don't recognize what's happening, you allow it. Well, Lynette, most of the time they don't know either. You think the head of the central bank knows what he's doing in most countries? <laughs> ha! No. In America, we've had two or three in the last 200 years, central bankers who knew what they were doing, but most of them didn't have a clue. The same is true of the world. I mean, I can only name a few central banks, very few, who have ever known what they were doing, and most of the problem, many of the problems that the world has had have been caused by central banks who didn't have a clue, or politicians who didn't have a clue. Do you think Jay Powell has a clue? I, I see that Mr. Powell's action show, he is really out of it. He does not know what he's doing. So he, what, he, wants to, he wants to keep his job. He knows there's an election in November. So in that sense, if, that, if you mean, does he know what he's doing? Yes, he knows that. He knows there's an election in November. Uh, does he care, care about you and me and our, my kids? No. He does, if he knows, he doesn't care. Yet he has a lot of power, so that, do you think that that puts us in danger? Or of the economy in danger? Banks have a lot of power. I told you about the guy, the guy heading the Bank of Japan. I mean, he has a wonderful time. He goes there and runs that printing press and buys and buys and buys. Of course he has a lot of power. The Japanese stock market, who knows where it would be if it weren't for the Bank of Japan printing and buying, printing and buying. Uh, is that good for Japan? No, read my books. <laughs> yes, yes, I have, and I know. You're absolutely right. Here's a, here is, though, my mother always used to say to me, don't you think that, you're, that, that uh, Greenspan is smarter than you? And I would say to her, Ma, if he really believes the garbage that's coming out of his mouth, then frankly, no, I don't think he's smarter than me. I don't think he believed what was coming out of his mouth. I think that was just his job. Well, I don't know if he believed it or not, but I know he's not smarter than you. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, Greenspan. thank you. <laughs> See, from your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> Greenspan has a PhD from a fancy university in economics, but he has no clue. I, once upon a time, he said good things, but that was yes. over 50 years ago. That was before he got a government job. He mainly yeah. needed a government job. He couldn't make it in the, in the, on Wall Street. So he tried to get a government job and he got one. And he got one. And he also figured out how to manipulate the price of gold so that people would stay away from it. Because really, I'll tell you, part of what I like so much about gold, there's many things I like about it, but it is out of the system. And because it is out of the system, I know the COMEX and the, you know, the spot market, but it's almost like the only thing they can do is, is gauge how you think about it and use the market so that you stay away from it. That's really what he said. 
they have done things. I mean, you know, at one time they made it illegal for Americans to own gold. I mean, they, they can and they have taken actions. I doubt that will happen again uh, because when they made it illegal to own gold, gold was the center of the monetary system. I mean, everybody, that was the monetary system. So they thought that was they, their solution. It's not the center of the monetary system anymore. But Lynette, these guys do all sorts of strange things. They think <laughs> that they're doing good for the world. They're not doing good for anybody. They're hurting everybody, but they don't know. Well, I'm sure that you remember when they started the globalization process back in the 80s. And I remember thinking, mm, I'm not so sure this is a great thing. And I think that the supply chains have been tested now in the coronavirus, but do you think that deglobalization really was already underway? Well, I know that throughout history, there have been long periods when the world opened, uh, and then there have been long periods when the world closed. Certainly in the last um, few years, the world has started closing again. I know that that has never been good for anybody. Lynette, do you want to buy shirts made in America again? You may. You may have to. Uh, but I know that history shows the quality is not as good and the price is certainly certainly not as good. You want to buy televisions made in America again? We might. We may have to. Is that good for America? No. Is it good for the world? No. That doesn't mean it won't happen. It's happened many times in history as the world is closed, and it seems to me we are now in a period, historic period, where the world is closing off again. History shows those, are, those do not lead to good things, but it didn't mean they didn't happen. Well, perhaps we can get a more fair structure when we open up again. And perhaps we can get a more fair structure when we transition into whatever this next piece is, when the central bankers send us into high, and governments too, send us into hyperinflation. Well, it has often led to that, as you well know, and. Uh... If I were a betting man, I would say we will certainly have serious inflation again down the road. But at the moment, Lynette, you know, mm -hmm. the price of oil has collapsed. Well, that's yes. the major component of inflation. So as long as things like the oil are down, we're not going to have too much inflation because that will cover up. I mean, go to the doctor, buy insurance, buy education. All these things are up, but and there is inflation. But with the price of oil and a few things like that collapsing, then we don't see too much inflation, at least not in the published numbers. Yes, you and I, when we go to the grocery store, we know there's inflation. If we go to the dentist, we know there's inflation. But overall, because of the price of oil especially, it's, it's sort of hidden right now. Well, how do you think the collapse in the price of oil is going to impact, say, Russia? I mean, I know how it's impacting bankruptcies here, but I know that you have a tendency, you you like investment in Russia. Do you still like it? I have investments in Russia. I don't have investments in Russian oil. Um, I was very pessimistic on Russia for about 45 or 50 years, extremely pessimistic. Uh, there's been a change in the, the, the Kremlin, as far as I can see, and they have huge assets and not much debt. I mean, nobody would lend money to the Communist Party. Nobody would lend money to Khrushchev or Stalin. So the Russians don't have much debt uh, as a historic uh, oddity right now. Uh, yes, oil is not good for Russia, but Russia has other things. You know, Russia historically has been a great agricultural nation. The Communists ruined them. But now Mr. Trump is making Russian Every day, Russian farmers wake up the net and say, thank you, Mr. Trump. You know, they put sanctions on Russian agriculture, so it's booming. I mean, here we are, American politicians trying to hurt somebody again, and it's great for, they love it. Russian agriculture is booming because of the sanctions. It has to. Nobody can buy or sell from Russia, so Russian agriculture is going through the roof. 
So if they can't buy or sell, you mean so they're able to feed their country better? Or can you can you explain why it's booming a little bit well, deeper? The Russians used to buy wheat from America, for instance, when they ran out of wheat or they buy cotton from somebody. But now they cannot buy wheat from America. They cannot buy wheat from Australia. So they have to produce their own wheat. They have to produce their own thing, everything, milk, cheese, everything. Yeah, they all, always had dairy, but now since other people cannot sell to them, they produce it themselves, and so ag it's, agriculture is booming. Is this good for them or us? No, but it's certainly good for Russian farmers. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because that's the point that we were talking about with the deglobalization. So if jobs are coming back to the U.S. and the shirts are coming back and the, you know, and the TVs are coming back, wouldn't that be good for our local economy? If you've got a job making TVs in Illinois, yes, and you didn't have a job before, of course you're better off. You are better off. Is America better off? The price of TVs goes up for 325 million Americans and the quality goes down. Yeah, we all survive. We are, we, we, we are okay. But is our standard of living compared to the rest of the world better or worse? Of course, it's worse. In 1920, the UK was the richest, most powerful country in the world. There was no number mm -hmm. two. They started doing what we're doing. Um, and they're not even in the top 20 anymore. Of course, they're still mm -hmm. there. Of course, there's successful people there. But their standard of living compared to the rest of the world is totally different from what it was in 1920 when they were rich, successful, and powerful. Uh, yeah, we're still going to be there. We're not going to disappear. But do you think your standard of living is going to get better if, oh. if, you, if, if you have to buy uh, shirts from Illinois? Probably not. Buy your shoes. Your shoes will be made in North Carolina, which is great. My wife's from North Carolina. I like North Carolina. But do you think it's going to be as cheap and as good as it was before? History would show it's not. And you, our standard of living will be lower than it is now. Yeah, but people will have shoe, jobs in North Carolina making shoes. But the overall standard of living will be down from what it is now. Well, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times or something like that. You may know that one better than me too. But I would say that we definitely are living in some very interesting times. Is well, there, yeah? My whole life, you could say that, you know, <laughs> good and bad. Right. I would agree with that. But is there is there anything that you would like our viewers to leave with maybe like the one most important thing that you think may come out of the current pandemic crisis globally? Well, my, my answer to, to everyone is please become informed, become knowledgeable, because the next few years we're going to have some serious problems and many of us are not going to survive. I hope I survive. I hope I become knowledgeable enough about what's going on, but if you become knowledgeable, you will get worried, and if you're worried, you will do something, you will take action to survive and maybe even thrive. So if I can only tell everybody one thing, please, please listen to talk with Lynette, listen to anything you can to get knowledgeable about what's happening, because Lynette says these are interesting times. Yep. But bad times can be very interesting and very painful. So please prepare yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, my personal mantra has been food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, because that's what we need no matter what's going on, whether it's good times or bad. You're very busy. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. You're very busy, too. I've been writing a book forever. I don't know how you just pop them out. That's amazing. Don't pay attention. You know, everybody should listen to themselves. 
That's what I said. If you become knowledgeable, then you'll know what to do. If you listen to hot tips, you will go bankrupt. So everybody needs to prepare themselves and not listen to others. Except Lynette. Except Lynette. <laughs> well, I'm very honored that you would say that. Uh, but I do agree and with you, not as far as listening to me. My nickname is Data Gal, so I like to give everybody the links so that they can do their own due diligence. I agree with you 100%. We, we need to be educated and informed and pay attention. So your nickname is what? Data Gal. D-A-T-A. -A. Oh, D-A-T-A. -A. <laughs> right, that's great. As I said, everybody should become knowledgeable, yes. Absolutely. Because that's the only, I mean, here's my favorite question. How many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? Well, that's what I said. Become knowledgeable. Then you'll know what to do. You won't listen to some secretary of the treasury or the head of the central bank. <laughs> yeah, saying, we're going to have a V-shaped recovery. Saying everything is fine or you should do this or you should do that. No, if you are knowledgeable, you will know what to do. And that is in your best interest first, regardless of what anybody says. And your family and the country. Mm -hmm. It's in everybody's best interest if we're all knowledgeable. I agree. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I hope you'll agree to come back again. Well, thank you. <laughs> maybe I'll see you in Arizona sometime. Maybe Bye. so. Maybe I'll see you in Singapore. Uh, hooray, hooray. Or maybe we'll all meet in Moscow and drink vodka. Who knows? There you go. See some of that Russian enamel and those onion domes. Those are beautiful. So yes. I would bye like, bye-bye. I would like to say thank everybody for viewing this and really share this with everybody and anybody. I mean, we're talking to the legendary investor international he doesn't like that but i'm going to give it to him anyway jim rogers and keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver in your possession and until next we meet please be safe out there bye-bye bye-bye